able to become Stalinist. Anarchists never were. An anarcho-Stalinist is something like a contradiction in terms. Last step. One world, one freedom. So, the connubial between Marxism and anarchism that I've tried to outline is not simply a demand of philosophers. It's not a marriage that ought to take place if the freedom of equals is to be realized. It's something that is inherent to the changes that we are witnessing and that, for the sake of brevity and lack of a better word, I would like to call globalization. Put in a nutshell, there is only one freedom because the world has become one. Globalization does not just mean that there are processes that objectively unify the globe, but also and foremost, that we have come to recognize this fact. In a minimal sense, this has always been the case because we have always inhabited one and the same planet. But what is different today is the fact that we have come to recognize it because there's no longer the possibility to adopt an exit strategy. The concept of globalization points to the fact that the stretching and deepening of social relation across space and time has become reflexive. We have always been dependent on one another across the globe, but now we know it. Fluxes from local to the global and vice versa have unified the planet. The world has become one at all levels economic, political, cultural, even military. With regard to the first, we have already seen how early Marx diagnosed the cosmopolitan character of capitalism. Together with economic globalization comes political globalization. They are inseparable from many points of view. Promoter of the economic and financial globalization, the national state, for instance, seems to be one of its most illustrious victims. Sure, states are far from vanishing and the repressive policies they are enacting all over the world is a stark reminder of this fact. But they are certainly being challenged by a dispersion of sovereignty both above and below them. Perhaps where the crisis of sovereign state is most evident is in the domain of security. It is in this field where modern state, at least since Thomas Hobbes, has traditionally tried to uh, draw its strongest justification, then one can best measure the degree of its crisis. Human beings, so the modern argument went, are led to cede their unconditional freedom to the sovereign power in order to enhance their individual security. Even if admitting that this has ever been the case and that this argument has ever worked, it no longer does. The state is today simply incapable of guaranteeing the security of its citizens, not only vis-a-vis -vis attacks with nuclear, bacteriological and other non-conventional weapons, but also, and perhaps most importantly, vis-a-vis -vis ecological and other kinds of man-made global challenges. No single state could ever arrest an epidemiological attack or even simply contrast the effect of the global warming. Hence, the dispersion of sovereignty through what some have called a multi-layered system of global governance, or others, like Negri and Hart, called empire. All these point to the fact that, whether we want it or not, an anarchist turn has already begun. The dispersion of, sovereign, of state sovereignty, both below and above nation states, closely reminds resembles what anarchists call for a long time federalism. Indeed, if it is true that there is a sort of historical amnesia among political scientists about Marx's contribution, there is an even more striking form of amnesia over the contribution of classical anarchists in depicting what a post-sovereignty world might look like. Titles such as the Anarchic Society by Hedley Boer, The End of Sovereignty by Falk and Camilleri, or even The Global Covenant by David Held could have been written by classical anarchists. But they are all books by contemporary political thinkers trying to make sense of what is happening in the world and with almost no awareness of how helpful classical anarchism could be in this enterprise. For instance, the quote that you see here which reads, 
the immense growth of production, the increase of needs which are, can only be satisfied when large numbers of human beings from countries around the world concur, new means of communication, travel, science, literature, commerce, even war themselves, all of these have squeezed and are continuing to compact humanity into a single body whose flourishing depends on the health of its part and of the whole. This could well be a quotation from one of the theories, uh, uh, the contemporary theories of globalization, but it's instead Malatesta description for what anarchy is. Now, this clearly shows what I have tried to argue before, that there is a ban on anarchism, but this ban must be lifted because anarchy is already there. The only problem is that it cannot yet be named. Of course, this is only one side of the story. If it's true that an anarchist turn has already begun, we must also add it's far from going in the right direction. Federalism is already there, but it's not yet free federalism. Globalization does not only mean horizontal extension of the chains of interdependence, it also implies an intensification of vertical ones. Power is not only dispersed below and above nation state, it has also penetrated within the deepest mechani mechanism of life. In a word, it has become biopower. The biopolitical transformation that Hart and Negri integrated in their concept of empire was first diagnosed by Michel Foucault, who traced it back to the intimate construction of, of modernity. Foucault's major intuition is the idea that while in the first part of modernity the sovereign power was mainly a power to inflict death, in late modernity it became a power uh, aimed at inciting, promoting, disciplining life. The two poles of such biopower are the body of the individual and the body of the population, whereas the means through which it is exercised are various disciplines such as medicine, biology, statistics, demography and the science of the police. But today biopolitical transformations seem to go beyond Foucault classical analysis. Biopower in, today invests not only in modes of governance but also the economic production itself. Capitalism has, has become itself biopolitical. Today's governance is therefore global, both in its spatial, spatial dimension and its inner nature. The fact that people felt the need for new words, governance or governmentality instead of government, is a sign that the thing itself has changed. No longer the centralized vertical power of modern nation state, governance denotes a reticular and decentralized form of power which is enriched by the pervasiveness provided by new powerful biopolitical technologies. It's a transformation that can offer possibilities for rebellion, but also open the path to the most horrible servitude. Power can today, more than ever, control the deepest mechanism of life, as well as the way we think about it. Within this scenario, freedom, more than ever, is only possible as freedom of, in of equals. Bakunin's idea that you cannot be free unless everybody else around you is free is more timely than ever. If our being increasingly depends on what other people think and imagine, if we are all part of a global society of spectacles, it's clear that freedom can only be attained collectively. There's no intermediate possibility. We are either all slaves or, or free. The new global movements that have emerged worldwide in the last 15 years have shown this very clearly. With their direct action on occasion of G8 and other summits, the new global movement may not have changed the course of those specific political meanings, but have certainly changed the spectacle that was staged by them. The organization and the actions of the new global movement perfectly respond to the challenges of our epoch. This is not only because many of its militants creatively combine elements of Marxism and anarchism, we will hear uh, this from uh, Laura Corradi presentation, even more so, 
This is because, as Graeber put it, anarchism is at the heart of the movement. It is its soul. It's the source of most of what is new and hopeful about it. By this, I do not mean that its, its activists uh, openly recognize themselves as anarchists, which is not always the case. I mean that the intimate logic of its functioning is anarchical because it responds to the principle of free federation and association. As is well known, the new global movement lack any central authority. They lack a charismatic leader and even a fully fledged program, program decided once for all. Yet, this doesn't mean that activists do not know what they want. As observers locked into traditional forms of hierarchical politics may think, it means that it is not a movement that grew. It, is, it means that it is a movement that grew up according to a logic of networking, which strictly follows the emerging needs and affinities of the people. Its organization is non-hierarchical, its coordination decentralized, its decision-making shaped by new attempt to reinvent new forms of direct democracy, thus favoring strategies for consensus finding rather than simply majority rule. In brief, it works according to what anarchists have for a long time called free federalism. The same logic, I think, is at work in the spontaneous rebellion currently going on in the Middle East. It's perhaps too early to say where this will lead, whether the revolution will lead to permanent changes in the deepest structure of those society, or whether new dictators will take the place of old ones. But one thing is sure, these revolutions have changed the spectacle of politics because they have disclosed new spaces for collective political action. And they have done so through the same modality that we have seen at work in other regions of the world, from Seattle to Genoa, that is, horizontal networks that have no single central reader and are thus, strictly speaking, anarchical. Conclusions. Globalization has become reflective. People act in the world and think about their action with, within the globe as their origin of experience. Activists networking from one side of the globe to the other, migrants crossing legally or illegally borders, and even political institutions above and below the nation state, they all proclaim one and the same thing. Networks are better than hierarchies. Otherwise said, globalization has demonstrated what modern political theorists have always been reluctant to recognize. An anarchic order is not only possible, it's also desirable. In conclusion, let me recall Pedrini's poem from which we began. It's not by chance that this poem has recently become a popular song within the new global movement in Italy and elsewhere. I will show you the song in a moment. The reason why so many people found it inspiring in recent time is that it perfectly expresses the view of freedom outlined before. One is the world, one must be freedom, because we are all on the same galleon. In a world in which the fate of a few islands depends on the factories on the other side of the globe, in which a nuclear explosion or a tsunami in Japan can have effects worldwide, in which the planet has become a global society of spectacle, you cannot be autonomous without being free, or what is the same, you cannot be free on your own. It's a very radical view of freedom, but one that is timelier today than ever before. History, I would say, has reversed the liberal motto, your freedom ends where that of the others begins, into a new motto, a black and red one. Your freedom can only begin with that of everybody else. Thank you.